Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning. Growing. Succeeding. And steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation and OCO TV. This is how we share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. What do? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. And welcome to Dilligua, the historic Cherokee village set in the year 1710. It's here that Cherokee traditions and culture are shared for visitors to experience. But Cherokee Nation citizens are keeping our traditions and culture alive throughout the Cherokee Nation. In this episode, we'll introduce you to some of those culture keepers. We'll meet an elder who shares her recipe for kanachi. And we'll go with fishermen on Lake Uchi to teach us how to gig. And we'll learn how to play the age-old game of marbles. But first, we join a group of fiddlers who brought mountain music to the Cherokee Nation from our original homelands in the southeastern United States. So they have ten or eight guys and got these good job in here, not done a lot of skis. Go, yeah. Are you ready? Fiddling has been a part of the Cherokee culture for many years. Different immigrants that come into America, they introduced fiddling music to the Cherokees. Well, the music all blended together to form, you know, what people used to refer to as mountain music and Appalachians. And so then Cherokees came from the east down here to Oklahoma and brought some of the music with them. That was their form of entertainment, you know, before days of electricity. And so they would have these square dances and they'd, they'd play all night. The fiddle has a unique, it's got a unique sound and uh, there's something about the fiddle that it just, it's a hard way to put it, but it, it kind of draws you. I knew that that was my thing whenever I first heard my dad play. And that, that's when I first began to put a fiddle in my hands. The sound of the fiddle is just something in there, just, just it grows on you. It's part of you. When, whenever you play it, it strikes a note in yourself. Your whole, your whole being feels it. Uh, I don't know what it is about the fiddle, but uh, it draws people. And uh, if people like music, like most, they'll like the fiddle. Yeah, it's, it's a good pastime. I mean, I'd, I'd recommend it to anyone to take up fiddle or a guitar and, and just learn to play music. I started playing fiddle when I was about seven years old. My father would put this up on the attic and hide it, but I would get it out and I'd play it. The biggest thing I get out of these is just jamming with people, you know, playing music over in the corner and pretty soon you got three or four or five people and here comes some more, pretty soon you got a whole circle of people and we're, you know, making some pretty good music sometimes. I'm the coordinator of the Cherokee Nation uh, National Holiday Fillers Contest. This year we had a pretty good crowd. I think we had about around 20 this year, which is uh, quite a few. 
and we had a, a largest, probably the largest crowd of uh, the fans uh, that came as well, the listeners. It was it was a big it was a big event this year. When I'd go to fiddle contests or music festivals, you know, I usually had this fiddle with me. Well, I'd, I'd ask him for an autograph. Our dad was a fiddle player and a guitar player, and also our grandpa. Well, they both played fiddle. I guess it kind of runs in the family. Actually, our dad played guitar. We had a guitar around the house uh, all the time. We didn't, I didn't know he played fiddle until after he had passed away. He was a World War II. He was a World War II veteran. And uh, he uh, farmed. And uh, so the first three kids came along while well, he had some time, I guess. And uh, then the next three came along, and that's probably about the time that he had to quit playing because he was pretty busy by then. He farmed with a team of mules. And, uh, but we always had a guitar laying around. And uh, I remember him uh, late in the evening, he'd be sitting on the porch and he'd be playing. That's my memories of Nice Cat uh, Job. Great memories. Just open them up and let's look at them, okay? And there's yours, Cross. Can you show us how you open I hope that the grandkids take it take it up because they uh, they seem to be interested at this point and uh, they like fiddling around. Of course, their their arms and fingers are a little too short, you know, to really make good clear notes. But you know, in time, kids will grow, and uh, hopefully that uh, they'll pick up on it. I've always loved music. I've always loved the people that played music. And that's Cherokee fiddling. That's what it means to me, is to be around other Cherokee fiddlers. Yeah, I told someone not long ago, I said, all those old timers are gone, you know, there's nobody to play with. So he looked at me and he said, I guess you all are the old timers now. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, you're probably right. Music and food are two key aspects of Cherokee culture. Edith Knight was a Cherokee national treasure who, before she passed, taught us how to make a traditional Cherokee dish called kanachi. My name is Edith Knight. I'm a Cherokee national treasure. My craft was uh, traditional clothing, but I'm also involved in food, traditional foods. I have one, I had two, three brothers and two sisters, and uh, my dad was a full blood, but my mama was Scotch-Irish. I went to school at Chalk Bluff, and uh, of course, had to walk to school, rain, some sleet or snow, whatever. Some of, the, some of the kids that went to school talked Cherokee, but the teachers didn't like for them to do that. They got in trouble if they talked Cherokee to each other while we were in grade school. So I, I did not learn to speak it. I knew who my husband was quite a while before we ever got together. When I was in high school, there was always a uh, some young men that would drive their cars around the block of the high school. So we'd be sitting out on the lawn waiting to go back after, back into class. So we'd get to watching them drive their cars around the block. So I spied him and I liked his car. So when we got together, he was, like I said, he was just bashful. But we got along, and our backgrounds were similar. So it made it all right. And I tell everybody, I chased him till he caught me. <laughs> I guess we'll just hold each other up for the rest of the years we've got together. <laughs> my mama always made my clothes. She would take the clothing that we outgrew and she'd make it into a quilt top. But that made me like to sew again. I guess that's where I got the liking to sew was to watch her. I didn't start traditional clothing until the, my grandchildren come along, the tear dresses. And I made a few shawls. 
they wanted to be in the Little Mr. and Miss Cherokee contest, so I just learned how to make their clothes. As my mother would be cooking, well, I would have my little nose up there to see what she was doing. My mother taught me how to make kanechi and just about everything that I, that I know how to do. Kanechi is hickory nuts and rice cooked together. When uh, the hickory nuts are ready to harvest, they will fall, and it's usually long about October, last of October when they start falling, and a lot of them will fall with this uh, hull, outer hull, but when they hit the ground, they'll burst open and you can just pick them up. And from here, we crack them into a smaller piece, and then they're ready to grind in the uh, canone. This is called a canone. This block is called a canone. After the hickory nuts have been pounded, make it, make it into a ball, you take that ball and then you break it up and drop it down into water boiling. Cook it at least 10 minutes to get rid of all the bacteria. And then uh, after that's cooked, then I run it through a sieve to get rid of the larger hulls, and then I cook that again, cook that until it's, uh, the juice will start to thicken a little bit, and then I run it through a strainer to get the rest of the hulls out. And then I take that, I call it slurry, it's, it's, it's just so liquid, and I add that to cooked rice and add sugar to it. Top of my world. I like I like to see people eat. I like for them to enjoy what they're eating. If they like it half as good as I like making it and sharing it with them, I'm happy. I guess what I would like for people to remember me is that I'd like to be thought of as a giving person, a loving person, and I guess that's that's about all I could ever want. Just remember that. Learn as much as you can about your history because it's important to know who you are, where you come from, and I think it makes you a stronger person whenever you find out what all the Cherokees has had to go through. I think that's what, that's what our, us Cherokees are. We're strong. We're really stronger than what we think we are. And I like that. Every April, fishermen hold a unique tournament here in the Cherokee Nation. Participants use a traditional method called gigging to catch the fish. This year, we followed along with two groups of champion giggers, each hoping to win the competition. In Jay, Oklahoma, on the eastern edge of the Cherokee Nation, gigging is a way of life. When we go gigging, it's almost always at night because you can see the fish better. And you've got about a 10 to 12 foot pole with one of these on the end of it. And you see the fish and stick them if you can. Used to go frog gigging a little bit. Oh, you can gig them off of the bank, but it's, it's harder. It's just easy out in the boat. It don't take very long to kill them at first fish. Dad used to bring us down here when we was just little kids. And we'd gig like for 10 minutes a piece. Boy, we'd be back there watching his watch. If you didn't miss, you didn't get down from the front of the boat, you know? I mean, I'd jerk the boat around and move him around, go fast and stuff to try to make him miss so I could get up there. <laughs> Each year, every gigger from this part of the country puts their pride on the line to compete in the annual gigging tournament on Lake Uchi. 
The tournament draws thousands of people from all over the Cherokee Nation and 70 to 80 boats that line the shore waiting for nightfall. I'll bet 90% of them are probably Cherokee because most people around here are Cherokee. I've been gigging in this tournament since the late 70s. Uh, won it 10 times. Steve and Greg Wilson are brothers and the team to beat. There's a reason we call Steve Wilson Zeus down here. He's just the best person to ever put a gig in their hand. There's, just, there's no doubt. Steve has 10 titles and Greg has nine, so we, we've still got a lot of work to do. Doug Posto and John Henry Ward, they're the king of the carp. King of the carp is what they are, king of the carp giggers. I've won four gigging tournament championships. Uh, we've been gigging together probably since we were 16 when I could drive. We would go, you know, on Friday nights and Saturday nights and instead of going to town and getting in trouble. A lot of times it was a lot easier to convince mom and dad to let us go out and take the gigging boat and go gigging. When it comes to competition, gigging is all about strategy. Going up the shallow creek for the small fish or out to the lake for the big fish. Yeah, you get to choose your direction going east or west. East being up the creek, west down the lake. And they'll draw your number out of a hat up there and put you in order. Who's on the end has the best chance of getting to the fish first. If you beat somebody up there by 15 seconds, that can mean a lot of fish. You can do some damage. Some people go up the creek and look for suckers, and we, uh, we're, we're not very small people, and uh, so we tend to go down the lake and look for the big fish, and that way we don't have to fight the rat race going up the creek. They go after the big fish and kind of get them up in, you know, real shallow water. Maybe their back's sticking out of the water and stuff. It makes it a little easier for them to get them. One year we saw him up the creek and I go, what in the world are you doing up here? He said, we're lost. <laughs> well, everybody has fun. I mean, it's, it is, it's a fun deal. Everybody gets after each other, teases, ribs them. But, but, but when that flare goes off, it's serious. As night begins to fall, the competition heats up. The love is lost for old fishing buddies as everyone waits for that starting flare. All I know is probably from 15 minutes before that flare goes off to, <laughs> to the time it goes off, it's, it starts getting a little nervy <laughs> right then now. Way nervy. Takeoff's awesome. <laughs> if you got smart people around you, you usually have a good one. If you got crazy people around you, they usually run over you. When the flare does go off, we, there's gonna be hateful words spoke. <laughs> At 9.03, when the waves start, there's gonna be 40 or 50 boats go that way, probably 40 or 50 boats go that way. We push out, and then he looks for his opening. When he sees it, we're gone. You gotta have everything go right. You gotta, motor, lights, everything's gotta be good. And then if you do get to where the fish are, then you gotta get them. During a the tournament, there's, there's not friends. It's dog eat dog, go get them. You know, there are certain things you look for and, and, you know, little tricks you learn and, you know, you're looking for little things that maybe just don't don't look right. You know, there's something that looks like it might be moving or something in the shape of a fish. And You know, sometimes you look for, like, the, the weeds, they'll start parting, you know, there'll be a big fish in there. Sometimes the fish will be so shallow that their backs will be out of the water. It's never easy, I'll put it that way. It just, you know, sometimes it's very, very frustrating when you think you see one and you maybe just get a little piece of him and, and you're like, man, that was a nice one. Should have had that one. But. And this year's tournament proved to be very frustrating for our two teams who did not make it to the winner's circle. You know, pull up to the bank, get ready for weigh-in, and you see little kids' eyes when you have that many fish, they're like, you know, they know that that's a bunch. You know, this guy brought me 40 in, but that's a bunch right there. And some of them will look and say, oh, you guys didn't do very good. And they'll just take off. And you're like, oh, that's hurtful. Don't we talk like that to us? Sucker! Fish are uh, weighed in and they have a different point for different species of fish. And the funny thing is it's it's all over a, a plaque and a fifty dollar gift certificate. It's a great badge of honor and it's something that we're all very proud of, you know, and, and uh, 
you know, I don't know how else to put it. it there's not anything really that comes with it other than a lot of pride and, and some bragging rights for the year. Next year. Uh, we'll see you here next year. <laughs> see you over there. Next weekend. There you go. <laughs> Deep in the heart of the Cherokee Nation, friends and families meet weekly, no matter the weather, to play the Cherokee game of marbles. Some consider it a lost art, but this group of Cherokee Nation citizens is keeping the game alive for future generations. Right. Yeah, anywhere. Endo. Marbles is a strategic game and a skillful game that you learn the more you play. It's more like a game of checkers or chess. You kind of just think, makes you think. My name is Delbert Foreman. I've been playing marbles pretty much my whole life. I learned from my father. After church, we would always stop by at Marble Field. They'd play till late in the night about two or three probably sometimes. When the older people were playing, we had our own marble field on the side. When they played, we'd played too. All the other families around here as well, they know how to play. If there's a marble field pretty much close by, they, they know how to play. Well, they've got an idea how to play. Like each member of the team will have a marble and they start off from the second hole, they'll throw to the first. And the object is to try to make the hole. When one team goes all the way through to the fifth hole, and it comes all the way back to the first, and each member has made the last hole, that's how you win. Start the game behind the second hole, and we roll to the first hole up there. When the game gets close, it's gonna be on teams. We're gonna lag. It's what they call lagging. You know, when you play pool and stuff, you get a partner. Looks like Bill's my partner. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, oh, I might be right. Jay, way out there. Bill and Rich are on sides, me and Jared. We use a smaller ring, and whenever you get inside that ring, you can just pick it up and set it in the hole. I can just reach in, you know, because I'm in there, see it? But he's got to scoot back and roll it from back there. Nowadays, we use an outer ring. When you get in there, you have to scoot back behind that ring to try to make the hole. Before, they didn't have that outer ring. They would just play with that smaller ring. So if when you roll in, you got to stay behind the hole. We call that the marble line. So all up there like that. Try to make in that circle up there. Which I got pretty close. And when they make the second hole right here, they become a two hitter. Help me out. Oh, 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 oh. oh he made it. If you're playing a two-on-two -two game and your partner's at, at the next hole having problems trying to make Whoa, it. Oh, he's out. You want to hit their marble as far as you can away from the hole. That way it gives them two or three times to try to make it. Oh. You better make, make it. it. He did hit too. A lot of times too, whenever they hit hard, it's just to get into the other person's head. They'll start talking to you, just trying to mess you up. Might as well go no mercy. It's pretty much like heckling, just so that you would miss. Don't hit the camera. Get them out of their game. It's all done for fun. <laughs> 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 That's where we pretty much just hang out and just have fun with each other. Andy knows. <laughs> Andy's my uncle. They used to always be the ones that were on top always making it to Tahlequah, play the Cherokee National Holiday Marble Tournament. That's pretty good to look at. This was Bernice's journal, Andy's wife. I guess she probably didn't know she was doing it for history and thing, probably just like for, how would you say it? Like minutes or something. Yeah. We got second last year, third before, and then we 
won it this year. We won it four times in a row at one time. Larry Crittenden, Richard Fields, Isaac Youngberg, and Dennis Sixkiller. Back in 1998, and uh, we won it, we won that tournament that yeah. year. That's been a few years back. We used to play over there at, uh, by Lee Foreman's house. We had a lot of fun. This is my grandpa, Lee. He's the one who used to take care of the marble field up there, too. He used to make the hole, get it all set up, smooth the holes out. And now that's what we do. My son, he wanted to learn, so I started teaching him probably around two or three. I guess he thought it was pretty fun. He learned to play pretty good. Whoever wants to play, we tell him, just come on, you'll learn. Ooh. We'll teach you how. The Cherokee Nation is rich in heritage and cultural traditions. If you'd like to watch more uniquely Cherokee stories, please visit our website, oco.tv. And now you can bring both seasons of OCO, Voices of the Cherokee People, home for the holidays on DVD. To get your copy, visit cherokeegiftshop.com. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye. We say, don't adago ha'i. We'll see each other again. So until next time, wado. Coming up on season three of OCO, Voices of the Cherokee People in 2017. Cherokee National Treasure Richard Fields teaches us how to make a traditional Cherokee bow. And it all starts by picking the right tree. You see that? You see it looks pretty decent, but it goes like this. Yeah. Comes back and goes this way. That works like a good one. And a look back in history to 1785 and the signing of the Treaty of Hopewell, the circumstances that led to the very first treaty between the Cherokee Nation and the United States government. And plenty of profiles of Cherokee Nation citizens leaving their mark on the world around them. Tune in next year for more authentic stories from the Cherokee Nation. Active teens are happy teens, so don't let sports injuries or illnesses sideline them. Tribal health benefits only cover so much, so get your teen insured with CHIP. CHIP is an additional free or low-cost insurance designed to keep your teenagers healthy. Contact Indian Healthcare Resource Center in Tulsa or visit oco.tv and click on links mentioned for more info. The Cherokee Nation has a higher rate of uninsured children on both a national and state level. Injuries can arise unexpectedly away from home, especially in athletes. With Sooner Care, children get the specialty care that they need to get back on the road to recovery. Care that Indian Health Services may not cover. Get in the game, get covered. Stop by or call your local patient benefits coordinator at any Cherokee Nation Health Center and W.W. Hastings Hospital.